Greetings, timeless sagas enthusiasts. Today, we are embarking on a journey to the medieval era, a time of chivalry and valiant knights. Get ready to strap on your armor and mount your steed as we delve into the captivating world of these legendary warriors and their impact on society. Our story begins in the early medieval period when the concept of knighthood first emerged. These early knights were mounted warriors, serving the nobility and lords in exchange for land or other forms of patronage. But, as time went on, the role of knights evolved, and so did the ideals and values associated with them. Now, close your eyes and imagine a medieval knight. You're probably envisioning a brave warrior clad in shining armor, galloping into battle on a trusty steed, right? While that image certainly captures some aspects of knighthood, there was much more to being a knight than just fighting in battles. Knighthood was not only about physical prowess but also about adhering to a code of conduct called chivalry. This code dictated how knights should behave both on and off the battlefield. Chivalry was all about honor, loyalty, and courtly manners. Knights were expected to be humble, courteous, and protective of those weaker than themselves, especially women. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before becoming a knight, one had to undergo rigorous training, starting at a young age. The journey began as a page, usually around the age of seven. The young boy would leave his family to live in the household of a lord or a knight, where he would learn basic skills such as horsemanship, hunting, and even some reading and writing. Once the page reached adolescence, usually around the age of 14, he would then become a squire. This stage of training involved serving a knight more closely, both in daily life and on the battlefield. A squire would learn the art of combat, focusing on swordsmanship, archery, and the use of other weapons. He would also be responsible for maintaining his knight's armor and weapons and attending to his needs during battle. Finally, after many years of training and proving himself worthy, the squire would become a knight in a ceremony called an accolade. This involved the lord or another high-ranking noble tapping the squire on the shoulders with a sword, symbolically conferring knighthood upon him. And just like that, a new knight was born. Now, let's talk about the knight's most iconic piece of equipment, the suit of armor. Contrary to popular belief, medieval armor was not as heavy and cumbersome as it's often depicted. A full suit of plate armor weighed around 50 to 60 pounds, which is comparable to the gear modern soldiers wear. The armor was expertly crafted to distribute the weight evenly across the body, allowing for a surprising amount of mobility. In addition to plate armor, knights also wore mail armor, which consisted of thousands of interlocking metal rings. This provided excellent protection against slashing attacks and was relatively flexible, making it ideal for combat. And, of course, we can't forget about the trusty steed that carried the knight into battle. Knights rode war horses, which were larger and stronger than average horses. These magnificent animals were carefully bred and trained to withstand the chaos of battle and to work in tandem with their rider. Speaking of battle, let's discuss some of the tactics knights employed on the battlefield. One of the most famous is the cavalry charge, where knights would charge at full speed towards the enemy, using their momentum and the weight of their horse to devastating effect. The impact of a well-executed cavalry charge could be enough to break an enemy line, sending them into disarray. But knights didn't just fight on horseback. They were also skilled in ground combat, using a variety of weapons such as swords, maces, and polearms. A knight's training emphasized adaptability and versatility, as they needed to be prepared for any situation on the battlefield. Now, you might be wondering, how did knights sustain themselves financially? After all, maintaining a suit of armor, weapons, and a warhorse was no cheap endeavor. This is where the feudal system comes into play. Knights were often granted land, called fiefs, by their lord in exchange for their military service. The income generated from these lands allowed knights to maintain their equipment and lifestyle. As we've mentioned earlier, chivalry was a cornerstone of knighthood. This code of conduct extended beyond the battlefield and influenced many aspects of a knight's life. One significant area where chivalry played a role was in the realm of courtly love. Courtly love was a highly stylized and romanticized form of love, often expressed through poetry, songs, and elaborate gestures. Knights would profess their undying devotion to a lady, often one who was unattainable, such as a married noblewoman. The idea was that the knight's love for his lady would inspire him to become a better, more virtuous person. But not all knights lived up to this ideal. As with any group of people, there were those who fell short of the noble standards expected of them. Some knights were little more than mercenaries, fighting for whoever would pay them the most. Others became bandits or engaged in acts of violence and cruelty. As the medieval period progressed, the role of knights began to change. 
the rise of professional armies and new military technologies, such as the longbow and the pike, diminish the importance of knights on the battlefield. Additionally, the social and political landscape of Europe was shifting, leading to a decline in the feudal system that supported the knightly class. By the end of the medieval period, the age of chivalry was waning. The ideals and values once held in such high esteem were fading, replaced by more pragmatic concerns. However, the legend of the medieval knight would endure, capturing our imaginations and inspiring countless stories, movies, and games. In that, my friends, brings us to the end of our journey into the world of medieval knights. I hope you've enjoyed this adventure as much as I have, and that you've gained a newfound appreciation for these iconic warriors and their place in history. As always, thank you for joining me on this timeless saga, and I'll see you in the next episode. Fare thee well.